This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists get funding, gain influence, and build proven, powerful communication skills for interacting effectively with the stakeholders who matter most in their professional world. Reaching those goals often involves effective translation of complicated research into engaging, jargon-free communication that distills complex topics to capture the attention of decision makers and general audiences. Interested in getting a free resource to help you do just that? Go to complexitymadeclear.com to get the 11 keys for translating complexity. That's complexitymadeclear.com to get your free infographic used by science communicators at major organizations to boil down complicated science and technical topics for key stakeholders. I am so pleased to welcome Dr. Chanel Case Borden to the show today. Dr. Case Borden is Associate Director of Training Programs at the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. She has a passion for helping young scientists recognize their potential and ultimately meet with success in their careers. At the NCI, Dr. Case Borden works to ensure that trainees are adequately prepared for the scientific workforce by developing professional development opportunities mentoring one-on-one -on -one and establishing a sense of community for them to thrive. Dr. Case Borden earned her PhD at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Molecular Medicine and her bachelor's in biology at Villanova University. Chanel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Of course. As I mentioned in the intro, after earning your PhD, you served for about four years as a postdoc at NIH designing and conducting research in transcription and molecular biology, as well as mentoring and advising several post -backs. What can you tell us about your research and what did you enjoy about your postdoc experience? Sure. The research was very rewarding, even though I'm no longer a bench scientist. So my project was centered on a protein that had multiple functions throughout the cell cycle. And my role was to sort out its specific function during mitosis. I think the lab has shifted focus since then, but I definitely did learn a lot during my time as a postdoc. I took some time to really learn about myself and really hone my professional skills, which is something that I didn't really put much emphasis on during graduate school. So my postdoc really gave me that opportunity to do that. I think the part that I enjoyed the most, however, was definitely mentoring the postdocs that were in my group as well as a couple of other graduate students and some other groups. So it was really incredible watching them grow and get accepted into graduate school and medical school and just watch them become successful. Yeah, I can hear the passion in your voice. And it leads to my next question, which is your decision to move into a program manager role at NIH. And were there aspects of how you managed that transition into the role that you think could be broadly applicable and maybe useful to listeners navigating their own career journey these days? So for me, I think I got burned out. I started doing research in undergrad and had just been grinding really, really hard. And I got to a point where I really started to think about, like, take seriously, like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And for me, I decided that I wanted a job that I could leave at work at the end of the day. Because when you're working with cell lines and timed experiments, there's no nine to five, there's no off on weekends and things of that nature. My schedule was, was often all over the place with not a whole lot of free time or downtime. So when I was making the decision to, to transition away from the bench, I think the parts that would be applicable to the listeners would be the kind of the things you hear about all the time. Utilize your network, talk to people, put yourself out there, and really just start to do the things you think you might want to do. So in my case, I talked to my PI who actually had a joint appointment in science administration and program management. So she gave me some good recommendations. I conducted a couple of informational interviews, 
And then ultimately, I was actually able to obtain an academic postdoc, which helped put me on the path to where I am today. Thanks for highlighting the burnout factor. So many people experience that. And then also identifying your passion, what you really wanted to do next. People say, where do I want to be in the next five years? But you really actually visualize, like, what did you want your life to be in 10 years? It's really important to take time out like that. Yeah. Can you share with listeners details about your current role? You're Associate Director of Training Programs, as I mentioned, at the Center for Cancer Training at NIH. And what you what a day looks like? I know I won't ask what a typical day looks like because most people don't have a typical day. What's your position like? What do you enjoy about it? What are some of the challenges? Okay. So sure. I have two roles, really, the two big buckets, one that is public facing and one that is more focused inward in the NCI training community. So in the public facing role, which is the outreach and recruitment piece, I spend time in schools and communities, attending conferences, sharing information about the NCI and the NIH, really with the goal of making research more approachable and helping it to be interesting and hopefully encouraging others to join the NCI or NIH in some way, whether they want to train or eventually get a job or even just interact with with the organization. Within the NCI, my focus is on helping to improve the training experience for all of our trainees, which includes everything from creating websites, application systems, running programs, hosting events, mentoring, like literally all sorts of things. So my two favorite things about my position are um, one of the things I love most about being at the bench, and that's really no two days are the same, right? I can do wildly different things throughout the course of the day. I can wake up, plan an event, and do everything around that event. And then I might go and do some website updates or work on generating an application system. And not me directly, but coming up with the ideas and working with our, the different teams that manage those things. Something that I've always loved about being at the bench, just being able to do different things, have different types of perspectives throughout the day. The other thing is really like helping others and the impact that I get to have. And during my postdoc, it was just like a handful of people, but now it's like a lot more. Just being able to see people push through difficult moments or finish graduate school or medical school, or really just hear students in the K-12 space saying that they can be a scientist too. All of those things just really bring me like tremendous joy and really make me love my job. Well, I want to ask you, in, in fact, you started the NCI Education Outreach Program, also known as EOP. And I'm going to ask you about that yeah. in a moment. But before we get to that, I want to ask about thinking about the outreach that you're doing. And as you said, making the work relatable, making it interesting for a variety of audiences. And that's something that many of us struggle with, particularly when we're doing sort of large things that could maybe be abstract or complicated. Are there go-to or mindsets or strategies or tactics that that you like to use in your toolbox as you're doing your outreach? That's a very good question. I think one of them is trying to put myself in their shoes. As a scientist and throughout your training, you fall into this mindset where you have to be the smartest person in the room. So you have to act smart, you have to sound smart. And a lot of times that means using language that is very particular to like only a certain group of people. So for me, when I'm communicating with whether it's high school students or even with elementary school students or just the general public, a lot of times I really just try to think about what might they actually be interested in hearing or learning about or what's going to be interesting and relevant to them. And then I try to do that while simultaneously still being me. Like not trying to pretend to be some fancy scientist or trying to pretend that I am one of them, but just, you know, I'm going to be me. So I'm a little funny, a little quirky. Like I still have some of those scientist aspects about me, but I'm just try to be relatable and use language that anyone can understand. I think I've practiced on my own family a lot, where it's just, you should always get the question, oh, I brag about you all the time. My daughter's a scientist, but then I never really understand what you do. What do you do? So it's like when you deal with that a lot, you use that opportunity to be able to work on that elevator pitch or that the three minute speech that you can give to anyone and help yourself be relatable. So I think those are the two biggest things or the two main strategies that I, I tend to use when I'm communicating with others. Yeah, so important. Thank you for that. And the family anecdote is something 
that I'm sure many people experience too. Just had Thanksgiving. We've got another freight coming up as we're recording. Thanks for sharing that. Now I really want to get into the EOP, the NCI Education Outreach Program that you started that enhances STEM experiences for K-12 students in the greater Washington, D.C. area. It really empowers teachers to provide high quality science education. You've talked a little bit about the type of outreach work you do. Are there any things that you can share about EOP in particular? Sure. The EOP is a joint effort between my office and there's another office in Frederick. I mean, we really do just work to encourage student, students of all ages to pursue STEM careers, regardless of if it's like cancer focused or anything else like that. So we often do like hands-on demonstrations in the classroom, special events, or do things for organizations such as like the Boys and Girls Club or Girl Scouts. We also support career days and give career talks and often have our scientists and a lot of them are trainees share their career journeys with students and really helping with that relatable piece. When you're talking to someone, if you're getting ready to apply to college and you're talking to someone who's fresh out of college to talk, to talk about their experience, it really does help make it more relatable and approachable. One of our most recent efforts was developing and hosting a part-time summer internship over the course of four weeks for the Montgomery County Public Schools called the Summer Rise Program, which was a very rewarding experience, very hard, but very rewarding experience. And then our organization is run administratively by employees, but many of our volunteers are the trainees. So it really gives them an opportunity to give back to the community, but really also help them to enhance their communication skills because now they're interacting far more with the general public and with students. It provides them teaching opportunities, as well as leadership skills for those who want to, let's say, help me administratively. Love it. So cool. And so many benefits as you've outlined. We'll, of course, have a link to the EOP in the show notes that accompany this episode. And you're also involved and in talk about cancer. Obviously, you're at NCI. Also involved in a really, what I consider, a super meaningful program that links cancer researchers to cancer patients. Can you tell us about that? See? your big smile. They're (laughs) enthusiastic about, I just, I'm just blown away by it. Please tell us more. Sure. The program is called the NCI Cancer Community Partnership. It's a very new organization that connects scientists at the NCI directly with those who are affected by cancer. I smiled because I was actually just working on something for this program because we're, I'm still really working to establish our footing, but we aim, the program aims to help the cancer community understand how research works and understand some of the topics and buzzwords that are commonly used in the media or whether it's in print or on social media or just the internet, but not really quite understood. And at the same time, patients and advocates get to share their stories with scientists who are early in their training and those who may get little, if any, direct interaction with the people who are work that the NCI has the biggest impact on. So it really does help us connect with our why, helps build and hone communication and speaking in lay language, and really just provides opportunities for cancer community members to have FaceTime with scientists. Thank you. Thanks for that. So many people can relate having been affected one way or another by cancer. As we wrap up, for listeners who may be interested in opportunities at NIH, just any thoughts about how they may learn about that, how, what it might be like to figure it out. Just anything related to, wow, I just listened to Dr. Case Borden and I, I'm all fired up and I want to learn more. What should they do? Navigating the federal government in an institution as large as the NIH, let alone the NCI, can be just very daunting. So my biggest recommendation is always find someone to talk to about what you're interested in and really help you navigate the experience. For example, if you're interested in training, narrow down your research focus and reach out to a training director of that institute. So if it's the NCI, if you're interested in basic or translational research, that would be, you can come to me, you can contact Erica Ginsberg. If you're interested in epidemiology, that would be the training director of that division, Jackie Levine. But most of the institutes, and there are 26 other ones (laughs) that have been centered, they all do things a little differently. So that's kind of what adds to how daunting it can be. So if you reach out to them, they're willing to talk to you about their institute, their divisions, and the different number of opportunities that are available. If you're interested in becoming a federal employee, that's a little, little different. 
But it's you just have to understand that applying to USA Jobs is really an art form. So I just encourage folks to watch the webinars and you really utilize your network. Talk to someone who's either who's been successful or who has a job. And if you can, even ask them to review your resume. It just get that extra support. And I think to key the key to either one is really just don't try to do everything by yourself, right? Like really just seek out help and have someone help you navigate the process as if possible. One advice. Dr. Case Borden, thanks for taking time out of your schedule to be here. You shared some real inspirational work that you're up to and gave listeners specifics on how they could follow up and what they might want to think about as they move forward on their career journey. So again, thanks for being on the show. Thanks again for having me. It's been a pleasure. And listeners, thanks for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope we'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.